Here's a data set, monthly average temperatures from a weather station in Cambridge. This data set has one row per month, and each row records the timestamp of each reading, of course, and a few other columns, like the amount of sun and rain and the number of days with frost in the air. Here's a question we might ask. How have temperatures been changing, and what will they be in the future? It'll be no surprise, after you've seen me banging on about it in early videos in the course, that the way to answer this is use probabilistic modelling. In the first two videos, we looked at a probability model that we might use for this data set. This function takes in the timestamp t, and then it computes a sinusoid. Here the sinusoid has amplitude alpha and phase shift phi, C controls the level, and gamma is a linear slope term which allows my model to express the ideas that temperature might be increasing, or for that matter they might be decreasing depending on gamma. I also stuck in a noise term, a normal random variable with standard deviation sigma, to be able to describe the noise that we see in the data. I've also drawn a line on this graph, I've drawn on the line of predicted temperatures. This is just the sinusoid plus straight line bit of the model, it doesn't include the noise. Before we go on to fit this, I just want to take a sideways look at what we've done here and think harder about what the model is helping us to do. We wrote down a model for temperature as a random variable. But the data set doesn't tell us thou shalt treat temperature as a random variable. That was purely our decision as modelers. So why did we make that modeling choice? Well, it was the question we were asked that led us there indirectly. The question asked, how have temperatures been changing and what will they be in the future? And what it really said, reading between the lines is, how can we predict the temperature variable on the basis of the t variable? That was between the lines of the question, this separation of the data set into things we're trying to predict versus things we're basing our prediction on. The thing we're trying to predict is called the label or the response variable, and I'll call the list of them y1 up to yn, where n is the total number of rows in the data set. The thing we're using to make predictions is called the predictor variables, or the features, or covariates. In this question, the only variable I'm using for prediction is t, but I could perfectly well have asked for a model which used several predictors. For example, if I had a data set for the entire country and I wanted to predict temperature on the basis of both timestamp and which weather station we're looking at. I just want to repeat, this separation of the data set into predictors versus labels isn't something that's there in the data set. It's something that we as modelers imposed on the data to answer a particular question. This overall goal of having labels and predictors and trying to fit a function that makes predictions is all there is to an awful lot of machine learning, especially Kaggle style competitions with leaderboards of whose predictions are most accurate. Let's write all this out more formally. We'll assume we're given a data set where yi is the label for record i, and xi is the predictor variable, or maybe a tuple consisting of several predictor variables. And here are the steps. First, we choose a probability model for the label variable. This probability model should depend on one or more unknown parameters theta, which we want to estimate, as well as on the predictor variables, which we know. Let's say the likelihood is likelihood for big Y of little y with parameters x and theta. Next, we'll assume that the dataset consists of independent observations of the random variable big Y drawn from this distribution. Independence means that the likelihood of the entire data set is the product of the likelihoods of the individual data points. Last, we estimate theta using maximum likelihood estimation. This should all feel pretty much like what we did in the last video for generative modeling. So let's just review generative modeling and compare it to what we're doing now. The basic difference 
is that here in supervised learning we have a data set of pairs x i y i whereas in generative modeling we just have unlabeled data points x i in both cases we invent a probability model with some unknown parameters call them theta and we'll assume that the records are independent samples this isn't crucial by the way if you believe that the records in your data set should not be modeled as independent, you just need to write down a likelihood function for non-independent random variables. There are lots of examples in the extended notes for this course, which you can find on the course webpage, but we won't need any of this until we get to advanced models in the last week of the course. Okay, then we write down the likelihood for our probability model. For supervised learning, we have the likelihood for the label y parameterized by theta in the predictors. And in generative modeling, we just have the likelihood for an observation x. And the training idea is exactly the same in both cases. We just use maximum likelihood estimation to fit theta. Um, just a quick note on terminology before we actually go on and do some supervised learning. Other words for supervised learning are regression modeling and classification modeling. It's called classification if the label variable has a fixed number of possible outcomes, for example, good, bad, and okay. And it's called regression if the label variable is a floating point number. But that's just terminology. What really matters is that all we're ever doing is modeling with random variables. Okay, let's go on and do some practical supervised learning. Pause and read the question. Here's a data set of x, y pairs, x and y, both floating point numbers. Let's try and fit a straight line model to the data. There's no reason why we couldn't have estimated sigma if we wanted to. It just so happens that for this particular question, the question setter knows what sigma is. So we're going to treat it as constant rather than as a parameter. And we'll follow the usual procedure. Write down the model for a single observation, then the likelihood function, then the log likelihood of the entire data set, and then we do the optimization. The question tells us the model for a single observation. It says that each y is a plus b times x plus normal noise. I've written it here in two different ways. First, how it appears in the question. Second, as a single normal random variable. The normal random variable is magic. There's a result which says, if you start with a normal random variable and add some non-random terms, you end up with another normal random variable. We mentioned this earlier on in the course in the video about standard random variables, and I told you that we'd be using it over and over and over again throughout machine learning. Next step, the likelihood function for a single observation, i.e. the probability density function for a normal distribution. One thing I want you to watch out for, don't just look up the formula on Wikipedia and copy it out. The Wikipedia formula doesn't have a plus bx in it, it has mu, because Wikipedia doesn't know that you are trying to use the normal for this specific straight line fit, so it just gives a generic formula. I've seen so often that students don't make this connection. They just copy out the formula from Wikipedia and then they get confused when their algebra has terms that don't make any sense. Next, we'll write out the log likelihood of the data set, assuming independence as usual. Again, don't just blindly copy out your formula from the line above. In this equation, we're talking about the data set y1 up to yn, whereas in the previous line, we were talking about a generic point y. So in this equation, we need to put in the subscripts yi and xi. And last, we just optimize over the parameters. We've seen the style of numerical optimization several times already, so I'm not going to go over it again in this video, although you should pause and check that you understand what's going on here. For this question, you could equally well do the optimization with calculus, and if you're interested in the details, you can see them in the printed lecture notes. Good. So this is a fully worked out example of supervised learning using a model with normal random variables. Here's another question. 
This question uses a different distribution. This is a data set of stop and search records from police forces in England and Wales. Scotland, by the way, has its own records and Northern Ireland doesn't report these numbers. So pause the video, read the question. The steps are exactly the same as always. First, we'll write down the model for a single observation. This is exactly what the question told us. Next, we'll write down the likelihood function. Y is a discrete random variable, so the likelihood of little y is just the probability that big Y equals little y, and you can look up the probability mass function for a binomial online. Remember, don't just copy out the formula blindly, translate it to the parameters we have here, x and p. Next step, write out the log likelihood of the entire data set. We're going to assume that the records are independent as usual, so the log likelihood of the data set is the sum of the log likelihoods of each individual record. We want to maximize this function over p, so we might as well gather all the non-p terms into some constant, let's call it kappa. And I've just done a little bit more algebra to tidy things up. Last, we have to maximize with respect to p. So I've set the derivative d by dp equal to zero and solved. And this is the answer we come up with. Let's just do a quick sanity check on the answer. xi was the number of stop and searches for police force i, and yi was the number of stops where they found something suspicious. So the probability of finding something suspicious in police force i should be just yi divided by xi. So to get the average probability across the entire country, we count the total number of stops nationwide and we count the number of those stops where the police found something and we divide one by the other. Now perhaps this formula is completely obvious to you, or perhaps your first guess would be to find pi separately for each force then average the PIs across all of the forces. It's nice to have a systematic procedure, maximum likelihood estimation, which tells us exactly what we have to do, so there's no guessing needed. Now, our last example, deep learning for image classification. Pause the video and have a read. I'm not going to go through the working here. You can find it in the lecture notes for the master's course on probabilistic machine learning, but don't be put off. It's literally the first topic in that course, and there's nothing more to it than exactly the same procedure we've been using throughout. Okay, so this is the end of the first part of the course. We've learned how to put together a probability model and how to estimate its parameters using maximum likelihood estimation. And we've worked through examples of unsupervised learning and supervised learning. In the next part of the course, we're going to go much deeper into how to create models. The idea is we want to easily be able to put together a model that captures all the features we're interested in. We want to spend our time thinking about what's in our data set we don't want to have to spend our time thinking about the mechanics of how the model is put together. So for that, it's useful to have a repertoire of standard patterns that we can use for modeling. And that's what the next section of the course will be.